Hello and welcome to Toastmasters in the Community. I'm your host, Fran Okasin, and I want to thank my crew for doubling up and tripling up in their jobs today. We have a very small group of members in the house, and we have had to redesign the script for this meeting, and it's taken a little bit of time and toll and effort, but I think we're good to go, and if we're not, we hope you'll realize that in Toastmasters, sometimes the scripts don't come across the way they start out, and we have to make adjustments. With me today is Paul Scharf, and Paul was not scheduled to be my guest speaker today. And you know, we're in the middle of our 13th year on the air, and Paul sat down and said, you know, this is the first time I've ever sat at the head table with you. I don't remember back that far, but I'm awfully sorry, but you're always working in the field. Absolutely. Either floor manager, cameraman, or whatever else, and now audio tech or graphics tech in the booth. So I'll have to have every, I have to make sure my whole crew gets out to sit up front. And yeah, that's all right. Very nice to be here. It's a different viewpoint. It sure is. You can't see anything. Once you get out of this range of, what, 14 lights above, yeah, it's all black. I right don't there. see the audience, you can, right. You can't see an audience. They could all walk out and we'd never know they were gone. <laughs> so it gets very disconcerting. But anyway, all right, so here we are in October. The year is almost over. Do you know that? And as Rachel said, this weekend, what, this Sunday is Canada's Thanksgiving. So let's hope anybody in our viewing audience who has Canadian roots, happy Thanksgiving. And you can return the favor next month. All right. <laughs> Paul, you and I are doing something a little bit scary. And scary? A little bit scary because it's something that I don't think I've played with on the show or at a meeting, to be honest with you. All right. I am going to do from the Communicating on Video Advanced Manual, I'm going to do when you're host. Now, I have done that, and I've taken credit for being the host. But then you said, I want to do uh, doing the interview. So I figured, <laughs> well, you know, why don't we just, we'll share the time, and I'll be the host, and I'll interview you, and blah, blah, blah. And you sent me an overview, and I figured I didn't know what the heck you were talking about. So we talked, and we wrote, and we talked, and we wrote. And this is just, this is how you just improvise which is another good title for something. So Paul Scharf is a past District 83, the first District 83 governor in those days. And that's your claim to fame. You know, nobody can say that. That's right. The very first. Absolutely. All right, you're the past District governor here. And this year, you're the Area 42 director. I'm the Area 64 director. So we are fellow directors. Okay. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. And yourself? Good. All right. So Paul... My evaluator is Paul Paradise, who's a competent communicator, and the title of my part of this two-man speech, two-man? Yeah, I'm human man. <laughs> First impressions are lasting. And your evaluator is Sue Brooks, who's going to be allowed out of the control room where she's doing the audio, and your title is The Value of Good Introductions. So, fellow members who are in the room and people who are viewing this, just enjoy the ride. So... <laughs> Paul, I started to give you a little bit of an introduction because we met many, many years ago, and I don't remember exactly when, but you took a distinct dislike of me, and it hurt because I figured, well, he's a nice man. I liked your wife, Sandy, and you came along for the ride, and Sandy was always the buffer between us, and that was a good buffer, and now she's buffering up in heaven. So, but over the years, we've sort of melded, or you got used to me, first time was that you, you didn't look like you were dressed for Toastmasters, but I got you to wear a tie. In fact, for a few years, you always came with two ties. <laughs> and you said, I have two ties. Which one do you want? I said, whichever one you want. Well, why don't you tell me what you... You were very rude to me. Until the day at one of the meetings, one of the district meetings, and you sat down at the table with Sandy, and you said, can I ask you a question? Do you think I should ever run for district governor? I said, sure, why not? And I, th I think that's when the tide turned, and you felt... What was I supposed to say to you, Paul? No, I don't like you. You don't like me, so I don't want to have you as my governor. I don't know. I give everybody a chance. But you didn't abuse the opportunity, and we're, we're pretty tight now. Well, I'm glad you gave me that chance. You would have had it anyway. Because, <laughs> you know, everybody values you. There are a few people like Tony Figueroa, Roddy, who's taken my advice years ago, and now look where Roddy is, international director. It's fantastic. All right, so let me just tell you, your speech is the value of an introduction. And I did ask you on the phone, I left you a message, are you talking about you introducing a speaker as the Toastmaster of the meeting, or are you introducing yourself as the speaker? 
And let me just see your first thought. What is the value of the value of an introduction? Why don't you tell the audience your feelings about that, and then we'll carry on. Well, the value of an introduction. Thank you, Fran, for that question or for answering asking. Thank you the for question. sending me the question I asked yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. You 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 said it just the way I wrote it. Uh, the value of an introduction for those of you that are going to give speeches, and if you're going to be introduced, is to write it and as third party, a third party person, so that the person can introduce you. The value, in my mind, first and foremost, is to wake up the audience, get the audience to listen, sit up and say to themselves, I want to hear about this person. I want to hear about he, what he or she wants to say. That's the value of an introduction. It's to get the audience to sit up, to look at the speaker, and to say, okay, what are you going to tell me? What are you going to teach me? What am I going to learn from what you're going to say? That gets the audience to be ready for you as a speaker to come up. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is the absolute value of a good introduction. So then a speaker, when you're doing the introduction, you have down here how should it be structured. You would give it three points then. Actually, I have four points. Four? Why don't you tell us the four uh, The thing? four points, and if those of you that have a pencil, piece of paper handy, get ready to write it down. It's very simple. Why me? Why the subject? Why the audience? Why now? And if you think about it, and you break it down, and I'll spend a few minutes on each one of them, why me? Why me? Because I know about the subject. So whatever the subject is, make sure that the introduction tells the audience that you know about what you're going to speak about. The introduction shouldn't say, well, I've been in Toastmasters 20 years and I'm a good speaker and therefore you should listen to me talk about whatever I'm going to talk about. It, you want to get the audience to understand and to believe that you know what you're saying. Why the subject? Depending on the audience, the subject is supposed to match what the audience has to do, is going to do, or has done. For example, in this introduction, my introduction here would be something like, uh, Paul has given many speeches in his time with Toastmasters, and in the course of giving many speeches, he has developed a setup for an introduction that will get the audience to stand up, sit up, listen up to what the speaker is going to say, to what I'm going to say. So why subject? Because the subject's important to you as a speaker being introduced by somebody who is going to introduce you. And why the subject? Because the subject is something that you use. I'm talking to Toastmasters who are speakers, who give speeches. If you're a Toastmaster, you give speeches, then you have to have a good introduction. And why now? What better time than now to tell you, as a speaker, to be prepared to develop your second or your next introduction? which may very well be two weeks from now at your next meeting. Well, you know, Paul, m most of my clubs meet, well, Richard, Richmond County is the first two Wednesdays of the month, Staten Island is the second and fourth Thursdays, and Smedley's is once a month, like that. All right, and then here we do two completely different meetings, one in the morning, one after lunch. What happens if you have a speaker who's on religiously, because you have a small club group, 
and they want you to read the same introduction time after time. Where do you put a stop to that and tell them, put something here, but then say something else about you? We've had people in one of our clubs who wants to write their whole history down, and then you can't service the, all the people in the club because one person wants you to read the whole page. How do you handle that? Well, if I have an individual, as you explained, I actually would take them aside before a meeting, after a meeting. I would call them. I might say, let's go to lunch. And then I would actually sit down and show them on a piece of paper the why, 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 and why, the four whys. And then I would ask them, what's your next speech? And I would fill in or show them how to fill in the four whys for the next speech that they're going to give and then have them write it and then that's going to be given to the Toastmaster or whoever's uh, introducing them and I would follow them as a mentor I mean we have mentors and here you're now a mentor and you're mentoring this individual on how to give a proper introduction you may have to do it two or three times and you'll get them to realize that they don't have to say I've been in Toastmasters and blah 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 or whatever but to say something that gets the audience in fact to want to listen to what the speech is going to be about not that the speech has been given by the person introducing you okay how much of the speech the basic part of the speech should be in the overall introduction I mean, don't you just tease people to want to hear more? How do you decide that if you're introducing someone? Exactly the words you said. Tease them. Tease them. In that introduction, it's, wouldn't you like to have the audience sit up and be ready for your speech? So you tease them a little bit. You tell them something about the speech but one or two sentences. The actual introduction shouldn't be more than four or six sentences. And it's just a little tease uh, about, don't you want the audience to sit up? You say something that gets the audience to say to themselves, I have to listen to this because I'm giving my next speech. Now, we have a lot of tight clubs on Staten Island and we all know each other very, very well. We socialize outside. We do a lot, of, a lot of things together. What would you, how would you react if someone was the Toastmaster for a meeting and they knew what the person was speaking about? I try to give silly titles to my speeches, not to give away what I'm talking about. But if the Toastmaster says, oh, I've known Paul for so long, he gives the best speeches. You just have so much trouble finding anything wrong with Paul at all, and they overly do you. How intimidating is that to the person's evaluator who doesn't know what we know about Paul? How do, you, how do you work that out that you let them know that don't tip the scales and try to put your feelings into what the evaluator has to decide for him or herself? Well, as an evaluator, what you should do and the speaker could or should, in many cases, talk to the evaluator ahead of time is to let them know that you want to look for just one or two things that need to be maybe corrected or changed. Uh, in, in one of my clubs, or in a couple of my clubs, the statement is, I'm going to give you a gift. And the gift I'm going to give you is, when you talk, don't hold on to the lectern and shake it. <laughs> okay? When you talk, keep your hands down. And if you're not in front of a lectern, if you can move, then move around a little bit. It's a gift. It's not something that you have to correct. I'm giving you something good. And let them know that I want to hear just one or two things about what needs correction. Yes, the speech was good. And yes, I like to hear more, but in the middle. A caveat. I remember years ago at one of our contests, years and years ago, Margaret Flory was our guest speaker. And we all know and love Margaret Flory. 
And Pam Kaiser was there, and she bawled me. I, I guess I was area governor, which I've been many times. And she said, you should never have had a speaker like Margaret Flory speak at a contest because contestants at this level can't evaluate a person like that. And Margaret Flory, being the lady she was, turned around and she said, excuse me, but I know exactly where I was speaking tonight. And if you listened, I put things in that they could have picked out. I always praised her for that, that she just right. nailed it right there because one was wrong and one was right. Now, I see that you have time to wrap it up, Paul. Why don't you wrap it up and watch the, climb, the clock, okay? Okay, well, uh, to wrap it up, uh, as I said before, in my title is the value of a good introduction. The value of a good introduction is, in fact, to get the audience to sit up and want to listen to the speech. The introduction is not the speech. The introduction is just a little bit of information about the speech so that the audience can say, I have to listen to the speaker. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, that was, that was fun. I, I was sort of intimidated when you sent me those questions. I figured, where are we going with this? But you know, it's so easy to talk with you and talk to you and talk about you. No, uh -oh. I, no, <laughs> I enjoyed this. We'll have to do this again in another minute. Talk manual. about you, that I have to watch for. Yeah, don't worry about it. I love you, Paul. You know that. <laughs> Okay, Paul, thank you very, very much. That, that was fun. You, know, you don't have to leave here. You're mic'd. <laughs> no, I'm not leaving. I'm just sitting back and clapping. Yeah, be careful of your eyeglasses. I got him. All right, our next speaker is Lucy Kahn. Oh, Lucy, I'll tell you. All right, Lucy's doing number five in the Humorously Speaking Advanced Manual. Make them laugh. Now, folks, laugh so it's on the tape. Now, Joe Marizio <laughs> is Lucy's evaluator, and the title is Lessons Learned, Lessons Passed Down. Let's all welcome one of our timers, Lucy Kahn. Good morning, fellow Toastmaster guests and viewing audience. How many of you still remember what your parents did to you, the lesson learned that you have from your parents? Do you still remember them? I do. I still remember what my father said one day, that I have to tell the truth. And I said, what happens if I don't tell the truth? And he said, your fairy godmother will take you away and put you up and bring you down to La La Land. So I said, oh boy, I have to tell the truth. Then one day, I forgot to wash the dishes that my father told me. So this means that I didn't tell him the truth. That night, I tied my hand to the bed post this way in case my fairy godmother would take me she would not take me because I have the bed with me. <laughs> then the next morning, I saw my father by my bedside. And he said, what did you do? And I said, how do you know? He said, well, the, your fairy godmother came and she said that you did something wrong and I know what you're doing. But she said that if you do it again, the witch will take you away for good. And I was so frightened. And then when I was going away with my friends that time, my father came and said, don't go alone at night, especially at night. And I said, why? And he said, you know that there are people with black, wearing black clothes and black hat and a big black car. They will take you and sell you. I know my, I was so frightened that during the day, I could not, if, if, if I see somebody with a black hat, I run and hide. So then he finally told me like, and also that uh, remember you have to eat your food. You have to fill up whenever you have on your plate, it has to be finished. You have to have a clean plate. I said, what's wrong with a clean plate? And he said, no, when you have a clean plate, you're going to have a handsome partner in the future. So I have to eat whenever I have my food. I have to have a clean plate. And then it's, don't forget the vegetables because that would make you strong and healthy. I don't, do you know? So then I said, I have to eat my food. I have to have a clean plate and I have to eat my vegetables. Now that I was going on school, we have a car. And I told my father, why, how can we cannot? He told me like, oh, you have to walk to school. And I said, well, what happened to our car? 
We have a car, and why do we have to walk to school? And he said, it's a good exercise, and also save gas for the car. So then I said, now what's the use of having a car? Then he said, that's for rainy days. <laughs> now that uh, I told them about, then he told me like, do you know that I don't have no car when I was young? I said, yeah. He said, when I was young, when I go to school, I have my books and I have to bring the family cow and go all the way to the family farm and then go to school. And when I come back, I pick up the family cow and also pick up some firewoods. And you're so lucky that you have a cow during the rainy days. So I was so happy, at least we have a car and I'm always praying for rain. This way I will have the car to go to school. I finally know that my father told me the lesson that I learned to be a good child or a good, a good person, to be obedient, to be safe, and also to, most of all, to tell the truth. So when I become a parent, I told my kids about what I learned from my father. I told them, I said, you better tell the truth or else they look at me, what? Or else what? And I said, the fairy godmother will take you away. Then they told me, like, Mom, there is no such thing as a fairy godmother. I have power the witch. The witch will take you away and will never come back. There is no witch these, these days. Then I told them about eating the food, and they went hysterical. Oh, we can have a clean plate. I guess put it on, give it to the dog so we have a clean plate. <laughs> And if that's not right, you have to have a clean plate, you have to eat all of them, this will be strong and handsome and, and become a good person. Then, then they to I told them, I said, don't go alone during the night. Then they look at me, why? And I said, because there is just men with, with, with black clothes and black hat and a black car and they will take you away and sell you. They went hysterical. Then they said, are you talking of the movie, The Men in Black? Oh, I said, no, I'm not talking. There's no men in black that day. Then they said, like, how about, how about the car, ma? You told about the car that you walk. I said, yeah, you have to walk too because your mommy walk, your, your grandfather walk, your grandparents walk, everybody walk. You have to walk even if you have a car. But ma, this is today. We need today. He said, you, you and... Grandpa were born in 1421. <laughs> so I said, there is it. I tell I'm learning my lesson. I wanted to learn your lesson. So I said, I think you have to give credits to your grandparents, to your parents, and to all the people to help you. And they told me, yes, mother, we all live on credits. <laughs> Thank you very much. See, that was fun. All right, now we're going to welcome up Good. Ken Raftery. And Ken is doing speech number, whoops, wait a minute. Speech number two, organize your speech, Ken? Yes. Right, okay, that didn't change. All right, and <laughs> your evaluator is Rachel Weiss. And Peter has a graphic for your speech. Light, red light is still on, folks. Okay, and your title is Stop, Shop, Watch Your Gas Prices Drop. Let's all welcome Ken Raftery. Thank you, Fran, fellow Toastmasters and viewers. Well, of course, Monty Hall recently passed away. And one of the common features of Let's Make a Deal, he would show the contestants of various products, and they had to guess, like, the price. So we're going to kind of do that here. Not that different from The Price is Right as well. So what do you think the cost would be for if you went shopping and bought a loaf of Arnold bread four Chobani Greek yogurts and an onion roll for you to have a sandwich with for dinner. Any guesses? $12. All right, Paul says $12. Well, the actual retail price, I have a receipt right here, is, he went a little bit over, $8.76. However, how much did I pay for that exact order? $2.33. That's right, my savings was $6.43. Now this speech is kind of a follow-up to a speech I did a few months ago called I'm a Smart Shopper, because I cringed when I watched the DVD. I started the speech by saying I've been a member of Smedley Speakers Advance for 10 years. Correction, 20 years is the actual number. 
And I thought I did a poor job of explaining Stop and Shop's gas rewards program. You know, I'm a math teacher. I said I could get high school students to understand how to calculate the volume of a solid of revolution, but I can't explain gas rewards. So I'm going to give myself another chance here. Now, for every dollar you spend at Stop and Shop, you get one gas reward point. For every 100 points you accumulate, you save 10 cents a gallon at Shell Station. And the points are good for 30 days. So, in the spirit of being a math teacher, I'm going to turn this into a math question. Let's say on September 1st, you spent $150. A week later, you spent $75. The next week you spent $25, and the next week you spent $50. How many guest rewards points do you have? Good. Paul is a good student. 300, and he didn't use a calculator, I could tell you that. So that means you would have 30 cents off per gallon of gas at Shell. Now, some people might say, well, give me a break. To really make any savings, you would have to spend a lot of money. It used to be there was no limit, but then they eventually said the maximum is $1.50 off per gallon. So to get $1.50 off per gallon, you have to have 1,500 points. Some might say, I'm not going to spend $1,500 in, or in 30 days in order to save on gas. But Stop and Shop makes it very, very easy to accumulate points quickly. As long as they have your address, they mail you coupons to help you out. Just as an example, 500 gas points if you spend $140 or more. That's not that hard to spend. 50 points if you buy two Kashi bar boxes. Well, I'd buy that anyway. 150 points when you spend $15 or more on a frozen purchase. That's not unreasonable. 50 points when you purchase three Ronzoni dry pasta. Well, pasta does have a long shelf life. 65 points when you buy two Kashi cereal. I buy Kashi cereal anyway. And 40 points when you purchase two Stop and Shop packaged salads. I usually buy two salads anyway. So you're racking up points, 100 points if you spend $20 or more on produce. That too, I usually do anyway. So it's very easy to accumulate points. You also want to sign up for the digital program. They, you could get additional coupons in that manner. In fact, that's, that's one of the reasons I had $2.33 for all those uh, items, because of the digital coupons. And I think one time I went shopping, I, I accumulated something like 1,800 points in, in one trip, and I didn't spend $1,800, I can tell you that. And one of my proudest moments, if Peter has the graphic, he could show it, but if not, I actually, I have a photo. Oh, okay. There it is, everyone. I spent 96 cents per gallon. There it is right there, 96 cents per gallon. And I was so proud of myself. And you could be too. In fact, my sister-in-law's sister's son works at a stop and shop. It's, it's the location I don't usually go to, so I was surprised to see him. So I was talking to him about gas rewards. He said, most people don't even use it. Really? You could give me the points if you want to donate them. I just don't get it. You don't have to spend money to you don't have to spend extra money anyway to get this reward. You know, so many things nowadays are overpriced. You know, I went to Governor's Island. This location wanted $8 for a draft beer and $5 for a soda. But here's a case where you can save money and just demand the price that you want. So $0.96 cents a gallon in 2017, I'll take it. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you very much. Okay. And now wow. we have Joan Marizia. <clears throat> who's going to come up and do speech number eight, getting comfortable with visual aids from the basic manual. And Ken is your evaluator, Joan. And your title is, who knew? Mm -hmm. Let's all welcome Joan Marizio. Hey. Hey. All ye fellow Toastmasters, maybe I'm set for pinky applause because half my speech is at home. So guess what we do? Toastmasters make up for it in another way and give another speech. This is still the same subject, but it's a different phase of it. I was going to give this as part two, but this has now become part one. So be it. Anyway, I'd like to say I first want to give credit to Isaac 
for talking about words before because words could be so mistakenly taken the wrong way. That's one of the reasons why I joined Toastmasters. I want to start with a funny story. My mother-in-law came here straight from Italy, had her children after she got married, and as they got older, they got married, had their own family, wanted to teach them some Italian cooking. We went to the South, Virginia, Langley Air Force Base, and the funniest thing was going to about a half a dozen stores until we realized we were not pronouncing R-I-C-O-T-T-A the way everybody else did. And her part of Italy in the South, they, they pronounced it, Adiagat. What's Adiagat? Nobody ever heard of it. It's Ricotta, Ricotta, R-I-C-O. Some people say Ricotta, and that's even better, because if you're in the South, they don't know Italian dialect. So you really can't say it that way, but we had some trip going all over Virginia trying to find this Udia gut food. But that's how she said it. That was her dialect. And you really have to listen for that because you do find people coming from other countries. We call them immigrants. I say welcome foreigners, especially the friendly ones. You welcome them and you say, you're learning. I have so many people that apologize for their accent. I just had two men, one from Ecuador, one from the Caribbean. I said, don't apologize. I said, I understand you. And I understand you because I listened to that music from the Caribbean. So they were both very happy working for the three days. What this article was about from the Reader's Digest, July, August 2017, was about eight different key things that Americans say. And I can remember three of them, but my memory is not as good as it was, so I'll give you the three. One of them was talking about lightning bugs versus in one part of the country, fireflies. Now, can I remember which part of the country it was? But anyway, I remember lightning bugs and fireflies because we used to put them in a the bottle, cap the jar, but then Dad would say, well, it's been a minute now, let them out so they can breathe, go back to playing or whatever they were doing before we caught them and frightened them to almost to death. Then there's the word tomatoes, tomatoes. Now, I thought everybody in this country said tomatoes or as we say in Brooklyn, tomatoes. We don't pronounce toes, we tes. Anyway, I thought the English said tomatoes. Or, you say tomato, I say tomato. You say potato, I say potato. Anyway, if you can understand what the person's talking about, and you know it's this red juicy fruit, then you know it's a tomato, even though they say it a different way. They talked about the word y'all and how Brooklyn people say use, use people. You know nothing about what I'm talking about. And I just laugh at that because I've never really heard anybody say y'all except a few very, very southern people that I've met along the way. And I haven't heard a whole lot of people say use, and I'm from Brooklyn. So I think that's funny too, but there's this whole thing with the culture and understanding each other. Now, I have to tell you, I'm afraid to leave New York because I talk like a New Yorker. I do not say New York, I say New York, as in hawk, as in talk, as in chalk. I don't say OR. I'm sorry, I'm from Brooklyn. This is the way I am. So you say, what's up with the words? Well, like I said, I want to thank Isaac. He gave me some food for thought. And another thing we have to think of is all the words that be are replacing something else as in. People don't say thank you anyway when you say, well, that was great. I appreciate your help. Thank you. What they say to you is instead of you're welcome, no problem. Wait a minute. The reason why there is no problem is because your service to me was so satisfactory there was no reason to say there was a problem, so I guess maybe that's why they came up with no problem. Anyway, I would encourage all of you to get in touch with France sometime in the future. This is my very, very bad list of topics because I wrinkled the paper so much. But on the first sheet, it's only up to the letter I. And then on the second sheet, I through the Z. goes all the way through. There's got to be scary 800 things on here, but I want to leave you with one more thought. I was looking at this and I said, this is a lot of words, but you know what, you get the message in the end and this is the message. To whom it may concern, we, the willing, led by the unknowing, doing the impossible. For the ungrateful, we have done so much for so long with so little, we now are qualified to do anything with nothing. But that's a sign I picked up in the store and I cannot refuse it. When you think about it, I think you could get this message if the person said it in their own language and not a dialect. Fellow Toastmasters. Thank you. Okay, and now we have a sixth speaker. And this is John Connors back again. You had your 
time with us this morning. You're doing speech number one from the impromptu, no, from specialty speeches advanced manual. And that's the impromptu speech where you had to supply your evaluator with five topics and the evaluator will pick one and that's the one you'll do. So what have you done? All right, John, I'm going to ask you to talk to us about an uh, anecdotal history of college dormitory. Oh. Anecdotal history of college dormitory. Anecdotal, I guess. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, Rachel. And I'm Toastmaster, my compliments to Rachel on an excellent choice. I entitled this an anecdotal history of college dormitories because there is very little of true research in this. It's based on my experiences, except for the early days of college dormitories in the United States. The need for dormitories came about in 1636 with the founding of the first college in the United States, which was Harvard. And Harvard based their dormitories on the traditions of the English. At Oxford, for example, all the dormitory windows faced towards the college commons. There were no windows on the back, the reason being that they wanted to isolate the scholars and not subject them to any outside influences. Now, if you go to Harvard Square, you will, of course, see the windows on, on the front, but I'm not so sure that the lack of windows on the back prevails. From that, there was an evolution of dormitories as we founded more and more colleges. For example, my own alma mater, formed in 1800, had dormitories for men who were religious studies people. But in the 19th century, women began to attend college also. Now this presented Excuse me, but I, I, am I finished here? The red light's on, the green light was on, the red light, I, I don't know what's going on. It's five to seven, folks. Oh, he's thinking, that's why he's working. Thank you, John. I'm sorry, but I didn't know where I was. But when women started to go to college, this presented additional problems. So by the time I got to college in the 1950s, we wound up with a men's side of the campus and a women's side of the campus. Very nice, we had classes together and so forth. But there was that division. The women also had restrictions on their hours. They could only be out until 10.30 during the week or whatever the number was, and 12.30 on weekends. And one of the things I never noticed until my then 12-year-old daughter and I were looking at one of my annuals, she said, Daddy, why do all the women wear skirts? And it was true at that time, even the dress was regulated. Men could not be in those dormitories any later than the prescribed hours. Now compare that with today. Far different. With all the changes, societal changes coming about, not only were there integrated dormitories in terms of men and women, but they started by having a men's floor, women's floor, men's floor, women's floor. And this sort of worked out. And then integrated into apartments now. They have apartments in dormitories where you can have a three bedroom apartment with the living room and kitchen. And again, these are now integrated even with the sex. Now this caused a problem for some people. In the early 1970s, I attended a, a function where a man was being honored with an honorary PhD. One of the people that joined us on that was an older man who was an idol to most of us. And he came down to breakfast that morning and he was all a flutter. He said, Mr. Lindquist, what, what happened? What's the matter? Uh, I, I was in the shower this morning, blah, 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 and, and I got out and I was drying myself off and, and this young girl came walking through. She said good morning and continued walking through the... Clearly, 
This was an experience that he had not had before, nor have I ever. But this was so common. But the integration of these dormitories was brought home to me when I went back to a college reunion. The college assigned students to accompany us and make sure we got from point to point and so forth. And one of them was a young woman who was a, the term is now rising junior. And she was a friendly girl and a lot of fun. So I asked her, I said, tell me, do the students still practice the practice of grassing? And she said to me, I've heard of that. Would you explain that concept to me? I said, well, it was a practice whereby a young man and a young woman would take a blanket and a six pack, go out by the observatory, go out to the golf course, and do what nature would dictate in those circumstances. And she just smiled and said, oh, John, why go through all that bother? We have co-ed dormitories now. And I'm toast. <laughs> John, let me tell you my Harvard story. About 20 years ago, I went on a trip to Harvard with the AARP, Tottenville AARP. And as my friend Dolores Okulowitz and I were walking up the path, there was the whole lawn in front of the administrator's building was all beautiful English ivy. And there was a sign right in the middle, please do not pick the flowers. And I'm a quarter or a half English, half Irish. I said to Dolores, I want to get some of those. She said, you can't pick the flowers. I said, I don't see any flowers. I went over and I plucked four leaves. It's still on my kitchen window. And when we had a big event at Staten Island Club, I potted some for Mark Laverne when he was District 46 governor. And the person we were honoring with a plaque from Toastmasters, our local DA, uh, Bill Murphy. And I gave them their own piece of Harvard. And it really, that, that's still alive over 20 years. It's still on my kitchen window. Huh. So, and I, you didn't my, get caught. It wasn't a flower. Oh, that's right. It's they said, try. please don't. I'm very literal. You right. Know? When it suits, <laughs> when it suits me, I, I can You're going to go for it. Oh, you bet. I've learned that, those tricks Absolutely. on Toastmasters. Well done. <laughs> but do not pick the flowers, and I, I didn't do it. But anyway, thank you, John. Now we're going to the evaluations. I'd like to cut down the time on the evaluation so we can keep all the table topics. Okay. So my evaluator is Paul Paradise. Paul, when you see yellow, then would you just... Uh, okay, I'll try to keep it. All right, thank you very much, very Paul good. Paradise. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I enjoyed your talk. It was first impressions are lasting. I've known you both for some time, so I found this very, very interesting about how you met years ago, how you really didn't like each other. No, I liked him. He didn't like me. Right. Thank you for the correction. And how Sandy was kind of like a buffer between the two of you. And then how you got him to wear a tie. And then I think you broke the ice when uh, Paul asked you about running for district governor. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like he broke the ice by asking for your help. And then uh, the, the, um, the interview kind of like got going in terms of being toast, Toastmasters. And I found the, the four points that Paul brought up very, very interesting. I'd like to repeat them. Uh, I, I, I can't read my own writing, but first was, why me, why this subject, why now? And I can't read my writing. What was the fourth why one? Why the audience. Why the audience. Why so those now? are worth repeating, and Three, I'm going to remember those uh, for my own sake. Um, and then I found the introduction to his speech very, very interesting. Just tried to keep it down to four points. And then some interesting things about being an evaluator, just trying to keep it down to Sue one or two things to, to being corrected. Uh, uh, Sue will be doing polls. Okay, great. Okay, so I think you, you're done there. The, yeah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's right enough. I the lights now because the time is gone. Great, I enjoyed it very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Now Sue is going to evaluate Paul's part of that double speech. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Sue. I'm evaluating... Paul Paul's Sharp's speech, speech. Yeah. and as Paul Paradise said, the things that struck me as important was the why me, why this subject, why this audience, and why now. Paul spoke professionally and eloquently. Okay. He interacted well with Fran. Oh, yeah. Paul, I think you did a great job hitting all the points. You had asked me to listen for that. And the thing I would give you as a gift is perhaps when you were making your gestures, try not to put your hand in front of your face. You did that once. Only minor detail. Overall, 
I thought it was great topics talking about writing your introduction in the third person, and you gave a specific example on how you would coach somebody to provide a specific wonderful introduction. And the best thing was that you reiterated your points at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sue. And evaluators, please make sure you give the manuals back to the speakers. I don't like it when my manual travels over to New Jersey. <laughs> oh, and it's happened a few times. Rachel is evaluating Ken's speech. All right, Rachel, are you, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who's next? No, Lucy, I'm sorry. Everything's all right. You're evaluating Lucy's speech. Okay, just watch it, the colors over there. Thank you. Lucy, another lovely speech. You in, we indicated that we were enjoying your entertainment for us by the laughter, and they laughed on and on through each phase. It was humorous because you also taught us so many funny lessons that don't apply to today's children. The jokes and stories fit the theme, yes, because they all were very applicable during my time, and I think I may be a little older than you, but I'm not positive. But I can relate to everything you said. They were very effective on us, but they were not effective on the children. The children, did, just as we did now, we laugh at you. So that was funny. The language and vocal variety were very good, but especially the vocal variety and especially imitating the children. <laughs> How well did the speaker tie the jokes and stories together and the transitions? This reminded me of this a, a program, program. This was then, this is now, and the monkeys made a recording that this was, that was then, this is now. So you reminded me of all that, so I smiled even more. Mm -hmm. And what could you have done to improve the speech? Maybe another six minutes of really funny stories that we heard. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that'll be another time. All right, now it's Ken and Rachel. Would you please evaluate Ken's speech? Rachel Weiss again. Thank you, Fran. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, organizing your speech. Ken, you did a phenomenal job this time of bringing it all together. The this sheet of all the, dis the discounts that you can get the way that it all adds up, getting the audience involved, having Paul called on to do the, the math. And <laughs> uh, I just want to encourage everyone to make use of it. I didn't realize I was getting points off at the gas station until just a couple months ago when, well, I guess it was a month ago, when all the gas prices shot up because of the hurricanes. And I went up to the gas pipe, and I was just about empty. And they said, you've got points. Would you like to use the, the, the points to discount the gas? I said, sure. Wow. And I didn't have my camera out, but it was 31 cents a gallon. Wow. Now, I thought I just jumped back to the 70s. But wow. you don't know until you do. So thank you for the examples. And I uh, look forward to your next speech. Very nice, Rachel, very nice. And now Ken will evaluate Joan's speech. Paul, Paul. I thank you, Fran, fellow yeah, Toastmasters, especially Paul, Joan. Paul, Joan. I was evaluating Paul. Joan's speech, who here? knew? So, yeah, during Joan's speech, I was here. thinking back to movies like My Cousin Vinny has that fa famous line where he said, two youths, or even Archie Bunker, who had that famous New York accent. So. I really like the idea of the speech. It was original. I guess we all think that we don't have accents, just other people do. But of course, people would think the opposite when it comes to us. She gave lots of examples of words and their pronunciations. The hand gestures were very good. She talked about putting a bug into, uh, I guess it was a coffee mug or something. Can, right? And the main suggestion for improvement, though, since the title, the topic was get comfortable with visual aids. I thought that that was like a little weak only because the thing you held up really, I certainly couldn't see it at all. And it came at like the very end as well. So speaking wise, it was a very good speech. But as far as visual aids, I think maybe make them more a part of the speech or certainly larger. So that's my main suggestion for improvement. Thank you very much, Ken. And now Rachel, if you'll come back and evaluate John's Impromptu speech, I'd appreciate it. Just watch the colors so that we can do the questions. That I will. Thank you. John, to be put on the spot and talk about one of five topics, and then to be able to bring that across with the distractions that were going on behind the scenes, 
you know, kudos to you. One thing that I would encourage you, this I, is, is the gift, is to trust your inner timer. Because I know I've had issues with the timers uh, when I've given speeches. And I, I practiced it, and I know where the different timing should occur. And that was one thing that distracted from a, a phenomenal speech. It made me think back to the times when I was in the dormitory and the type of dormitory environment that I had. And I'm sure it's brought back good memories to our studio audience as well as our home audience. Great job. Just that one little thing to overcome the distractions. And I know you'll be a phenomenal speaker in the future. Thank you. He certainly has great potential. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Now, we're going into... We're going into table topics. Let's make them one minute on the clock, please. All right? This way we can enjoy everybody's. Isaac, very quickly, do you have a go bag? If so, what have you put in it in case you have to leave the area in an emergency, as so many people have had to do in recent weeks? Isaac Govinovich. Madam Table Topic Master, Everybody, I don't have a go back. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to die in my apartment because every time I leave my house, I see such traffic. And if everybody is evacuating, it's not going to move. So I'm going to stay right there in, my, in the comfort of my own home. I'm not going anywhere. Thank you. You are so <laughs> obstinate. It's hard working with you, Isaac. Well, you said less than a minute, so I gave, like, what, 30 seconds? <laughs> but you made your point. Can Thank I go you now? Very... Thank you. Yes, you may go now. Not, not you can. All right. Paul Paradise. We'll see if we have time for John Connors at the end. Paul, where's Paul Paradise? He's Come coming. On. He's right well, there. Well, I can't see. It's black back there. He's right there. Paul, <laughs> please, I can't hear what the talking in that corner. Please. All right. Come on, folks. This is Peter's question for you, Paul. Okay. <laughs> you have been invited to address the United Nations General Assembly to propose one new international law that will most affect trademark infringements. What would you propose, Paul? Paul Shaw. Mm. He said that was a question that should be easy for you. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I probably would uh, advise something that is, would be adopted by the World Trade Organization. It would be, have to be like an international treaty, a treaty, a treaty. And they already have something like that. Uh, I'd have to check my notes. So um, I think there would be nothing new under the sun, actually. Hmm. Okay, you mean you don't carry those notes around with you? Well, just no, I, I, like I don't. <laughs> That's a very complicated question. They do have international laws regarding trademark, trademark conventions, and different signatories sign them, and they all obey them. So um, th there's, there, that would not be necessarily a, a problem. Yeah, I, I said to Peter, what makes you think he'd know anything like that? He said, from his speeches. He said, yeah, I know yeah. that he knows that yeah. stuff. He's in that territory. Yeah. yeah, well, see, when they're speaking, I'm usually trying to see who's next. <laughs> so thank you very much, right. Paul. It was a good sport. Sue Brooks, are you out here? No. If you're not, I'll call John first because I see we have three minutes. John, a quick question for you, John Connors. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Will you please share with our audience, one special memory you have of your mother, John Connors. It's a very difficult question, Fran, because I have so many memories one of my now, mother. Others to come. <laughs> <laughs> Sue Brooks, please get out here. My probably one of the funniest that I, I've ever seen was my mother was very helpful to people, and I'd go to visit her apartment. At 1806 First Avenue, and she'd say, "Come with me, Jackie. We got to go go to the stores." I said, "Why are we going to the stores? You have everything." No, I have to get stuff for the old people in the building. Now, my mother Sue's, was in her 80s Sue's at this time, right now. All right, then we're so oh, she had that, and she was always a very helpful person. And one time, we were walking down the street, and this old man came up to my mother and said, "Miss, will you help me with my zipper?" Oh. <laughs> And this being New York, you had the immediate thing. But then my mother noticed the poor gentleman had arthritic hands, and his jacket was wide open, and it was a cold day. He was looking for help to zip it. She was picked out by an absolute stranger in an environment, and she, of course, helped him. That's my favorite. Thank you. 
Well, I don't see Sue, so I think we just got, got this. We got, um, what? No, 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 Lucy, this, we're out of time here. Let's just have. Okay. That's what's, uh, now the next question was for Sue. It was tailored for her. But anyway, let us go here. Okay. Because it's about the Tall Tales contest. Okay. Uh, so we're almost done, Paul. And so how did you like doing the, the tandem? This was very interesting. It was, uh, it was something naturally I haven't done in all the years that I've been here. Mm. What's interesting about it is at least on the lectern, I can move a little bit. Here talking, it's basically from the waist up and it's real, you got to be good at it. And I guess I'm getting there, but We'll have to sit you up here we'll more often. We'll have to sit me up more often sure. because it was interesting to hear your question, think about it, and then turn around and look at the camera and look at the audience and, and start talking. And maintain what camera is on you out of the three cameras. And maintain which camera you're looking at and do the talking, but body-wise, physically not moving, except maybe the hands. And of course, I heard one statement about my hand was in front of my face or something, <laughs> whatever. Because, you know, 25 years only means that I'm getting better. Someday I'll be perfect. I don't know when. No but one's perfect but God. No one's perfect. So that means I have to stay here forever. Okay, uh, I will. I think we can put up with you forever. All right, thank you. Okay, but this, this was fun. And yep. we're just about out. They're going to be putting that music on any time now, yep. so you will not be with us next time because you're going to a wedding. Mm-hmm. 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 But well, at least you let me know beforehand so I won't write you in the script at all. Oh, yes, I will. I'll remind you that I won't be here. I have it on the back <laughs> of my cover with my cheat, cheat notes. Okay. I know who can come and who can't mm -hmm. come, and this was a, just 14 people here today, and we had to move people around. And, but that's what's so good about Toastmasters. We get used to doing that in meetings. Oh, yeah. Joan and I went to our Richmond County meeting the other night. It starts at 7 o'clock. We got there at 6.30, right? Nobody came. I said to Joan, well, it's 7 o'clock. Yeah, I had four pe five people on the agenda, 7.15. I said to Joan, do you want to make your speech or throw something in that you're not going to use permanently? Yeah. So eventually they came in about 7.35. And I figured, geez, you know, it gets rough, you know, oh, yeah. when you have to move things oh, around. Yeah. So, folks, we'll see you next time on Toastmasters in the Community. Yep. Here we go. Here we go.